Maria Janssen, who's come from the e, uh, Uppsala yeah. University, yeah. Uppsala, um, who's going to talk to us about um, the value and use of crowdsourced information uh, in online image archives. And I'll just... If you just want to pop that... Okay, so obviously I have to use both of these. <laughs> this podium is too high. Okay. Thank you. Okay, it's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Uppsala University and I'm just starting my second year. Um, so please bear with me if I'm too uh, over um, enthusiastic uh, or too naive of something. Uh, today I will tell you about uh, one of the studies that I'm going to include in my thesis. And um, what I will talk about is how collections in archives and museums can be more inclusive of their users' different perspectives and unique experiences, and how this can make a difference for what we pass down to coming generations. Uh, and it's about whose story becomes cultural heritage, or, or what stories uh, that become cultural heritage. Uh, so these pictures you see here are all symbols of users' own uh, reality, uh, experience, and meaning making of materials in collections, uh, which in the, the recent years have become very popular to collect and incorporate in museum and archive collections, uh, as I think that you are aware of. Um, user participation have been identified as, as uh, meaningful ways for the public to enhance collections while more deeply engaging with and exploring them. Uh, that is quote from Ovens, uh, 2011. And participation has also been described by Krauss and Jekyll to enhance accessibility for visitors as well as to provide useful information for professionals. So um, the question is, how are these participative contributions administrated and assimilated with former cultural heritage content? And uh, I chose to study this problem of inclusion by looking uh, on user comments added to institutional image archives online. Uh, so here you, you just look at one of the study websites, uh, an image archive online. And unfortunately, it's uh, Swedish material, Swedish, Swedish websites. Uh, but I don't think it's a matter for you, because it's mostly about uh, photographs anyway. This is another example. Uh, I think you all have an idea what these collection websites look like. Um, and this is an example of the user interface for one of uh, these websites. And you can see uh, that the commentary field is uh, in very close connection to the picture. Um, the commentary field is here. Um, and uh, uh, my, my main question was just how this data that, that is uh, <laughs> uh, incoming in this field is actually preserved in a long time uh, perspective. And when I'm talking about preservation, uh, I mean that the information should be preserved in, in connection with the image, um, and that also uh, that the information is searchable, uh, and that its integrity is protected, and there is enough metadata about the information to guarantee authenticity. So these criteria mean the information has to be stored in the image database. Uh, it's not enough to, to store it online or just to store uh, the website as you archive material from internet because uh, you need to, to monitor uh, the connection between the image and the data 
and uh, treat it as, as uh, all of the other images that you have in your collection. So, um, as I want to show you here, the format of, of user comments was free text. Uh, and this, of course, enables users to write whatever comes to their mind when they see an image. Um, so, as you might have guessed, and also experienced from Facebook or, yeah, internet, <laughs> this results in a quite, uh, quite a great diversity of data, um, different kinds of data, which make inclusions very complicated for professionals. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's meaningful not to restrict users uh, in what they can add, as this free and open style of inviting users uh, may result in, in um, more authentic uh, user participation. Or actually, as Agiatis said yesterday in the panel discussion, um, uh, the more open you are, the more chance it is your users are going to surprise you in a good way. And here you can see uh, behind the screens, uh, behind the scenes screenshot, uh, and this is an example of a user interface for uh, administrator, administrating professionals. So as you see, unlike the commentary field, this interface is parted in, in many different data fields. Uh, and all information uh, going in here is classified under some kind of label. Um, so information that is going to be incorporated in the collection database it has to be classified in some way and submitted in one of these boxes. Sorry if I'm going too fast, but you know, I want to keep your attention uh, and keep you all awake this early in the morning. So what I wanted to know um, uh, was how professionals worked with user comments and, uh, and what premises they included user comments in their database systems. Uh, and I also wanted to know how comments could add value to collections. And for these, I used a theoretical perspective of actorial voice uh, in organizing systems, a concept borrowed from literature theory and developed by Feinberg. And it explains how there can be a, a ubiquitous manifestation of implicated values in the mere organization of a collection. And I thought it was a good idea since there were no formal regulations for, for valuing uh, this kind of user-generated information. And the only formal structure that I found uh, was the information uh, uh, was the, the information systems themselves. So how I did it, it's not a, uh, it's not a riddle. It's uh, <laughs> a way to try to present some of my method. Uh, because I used a mixed method for this study. And I combined interviews with observations of systems and user comments. Uh, so I choose uh, 12 institutions and uh, made one interview at each institution, uh, each place. And altogether, uh, there were five different uh, collection database systems uh, in the study. Um, these 12 institutions were uh, archives and museums uh, at everything from local to national level. Uh, and only institutions that uh, expressly were asking for user-created metadata uh, in connection to their images were selected for the study. Uh, so within the institutions, I contacted um, the administrating staff of the incoming user comments, and sometimes more than one person was in charge of handling comments. So because of this, I have 15 uh, interviewees uh, in 12 uh, institutions. Um, and in the interviews, I asked about the process of administrating comments 
uh, of how they added value uh, according to, to the professionals, but also about other factors affecting their incorporative decisions such as, as policies, uh, staff resources, and work organization. Okay, so during both the interviews and observations, I focused on user contributions that added new information. And, and to identify those, I uh, used Van Hollen's categories uh, of user comments, um, resulting in emphasis on the underlined types of comments that you see here. Uh, and then uh, the interviews were uh, inductively uh, analyzed with qualitative content analysis uh, in Atlas TI. And an uh, example of, of uh, categories that are used um, were those different types of comments, uh, provenance, connection between platform and system, um, and some others. And the results of the analysis were then compared with observations of metadata structure and field functionality of collection database systems. So, okay, uh, what could it look like? Um, you see here uh, uh, a photo from Swedish village Frösen uh, from 1948. Uh, here you can see a bigger version. And uh, showing a very wintry Swedish <laughs> uh, street, street photograph. Um, this this scarce image description only actually informs about the place of uh, the photo, um, which is Frösen. Uh, and indicates that preparations are made for some kind of festivities. So uh, this information provoked a vivid discussion in the commentary field uh, about uh, facts of this celebration um, and memories from it uh, and how cold the winter was uh, that year um, Causing, the, causing pantyhoses to froze onto the legs of girls because it was so, so cold. <laughs> it's Sweden, you know. Um, and uh, uh, also uh, how to the square of uh, this town uh, for some time came to be called the Red Square because of all the glug or mulled wine and that was spilled during the festivities. So you see, I mean, you all become engaged now. This is fun facts. It makes you alive. <laughs> it makes you feel something for the material, for the collection. Uh, but uh, sadly enough, I mean, this, uh, it added evidential value to the image and context, very much context. But very little of this data uh, was added to the database and thus preserved uh, because there was simply no uh, data field to, to submit it to for the professionals. Uh, there are no fields for, for this kind of memories or associated data. Um, and uh, um, you, you remember this, uh, um, the boxes here? I mean, there were, there were no uh, fields for this kind of data here in this structure. So um, even in, in the best case scenario, um, uh, data could be, could be added to the gen general image description, uh, but this also made it less searchable due to a lack of structure within the field. It could be like a long story uh, within the same small uh, data field. And there was no formal structure to document metadata about metadata, such as contributor's name uh, or their history, data of contribution, uh, or reliability of the information. So, um, what I found was that in all those institutions included in the study, uh, free text user comments were manually handled, uh, and for the crowdsource information to find its way into the collections, comments also had to become moderated, which could mean anything from approved by administrators just by like a click uh, or to be included manually one by one in the data database. 
so there were many different levels there, but uh, there was no uh, entirely automatic level, so to speak. Uh, and this, this process implied checking facts, recording provenance, and finding a suitable place for the information in the metadata structure. Um, and this meant that the authorial voice of the systems promoted contributions that could easily be adjusted to uh, the existing data fields. So some typical examples of such contributions were concerning uh, time, place, or names of persons pictured, but uh, not for like um, memories or stories. And um, uh, all, anyway, all institutions edited or removed metadata based on user contributions, so they were appreciated and, um, and used. But contrary to the authorial, authorial voice, professionals said they uh, also appreciated the residual information, um, in which I mean this, these memories and opinions connected to, to the image. Um, and those were reported to add life to the collections and uh, witness of users' meaning making of and the material. And one interviewee said that she loved reading the comments because uh, they could tell her about things as smells and feelings of places depicted in the images and you couldn't get this information in any other way. Okay, I'm nearly finished now. And I want to become a little philosophical with you. I mean, what does this all mean? Uh, practical implications of my work is that if cultural heritage institutions uh, really want to take a serious interest in user participation and crowdsourcing, uh, I mean most institutions say that they want to do that, they also have to revalue their work methods and way of organizing collections and data uh, and also to make space for user generated content. The authorial voice of collection systems had to be recognized and changed uh, in order to become more inclusive of non-professional narratives of the collections. And I'm done. Thank you for listening. <laughs>